Welcome back to Cast Not Dead, the Bloody Blood Plus O negative special. That reminds me. I don't even know. <laughs> oh, sorry. I was going to make a follow up joke on that. Like, I don't know what my blood type is. <laughs> I keep forgetting. Uh, I don't know either. It's the, the, what's called one blood A, B, C, and zero. No, no, there, no I don't, there is no C. There is, no C. <laughs> there is now. Well, there, yeah, there's well, there is a C. Yeah, blood C. There is blood plus C. <laughs> yes, now there's new blood C type. So, yeah. The four bloods. Maybe that's the joke for that show. Good name Maybe. For a band, actually. The four bloods. Okay. okay, now we're sounding like uh, the world's end over here. It's like, that sounds a good name for the band. You should write that down. Huh. <laughs> So yes, we're talking about the Lost Kill the Pass game, which isn't a Kill the Pass game at all. The Suda 51's take on Blood Plus, I think. This is CJ Wakura. This is Infinite. This is Quill. And Sean Nice, Common Sentai. <laughs> yes, so we will be talking about the unreleased in America PS2 game Blood Plus, which is based on the one-shot Blood the Last Vampire, which also had a bunch of other one-shots. So, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this is kind of one of those, like, anthology-type things where everyone kind of tells its own story, but the basic cliff notes is, schoolgirl kills vampires. I yeah. Think this is and for the most... Memory, like, well, the game is, but he's... Yeah. Because of how the video game is, and me knowing its completion, and it kind of just... Spoiler alert, I'll just say this already. It just ends with her waking up from some dream, I think. So it's like, eh, I think he's kind of correct on that. I think the only one that's at least continuing off of the original anime was Blood Sea, I think. Because it literally says the second anime series in the franchise. So I'm very much assuming it was a follow-up. And my only exposure to the series was the one shot that Manga Video did, which I bought sight unseen when it came out. It's like, oh, schoolgirl kills vampires, and it looks cool, and it doesn't really have much of a cohesive plot. It's just like, she kind of just goes from A to B and just kills things. There's no real explanation of who she is, who these people are, why she's doing it. Just, yeah. Yeah, because I think even in the first anime series, it was even she had amnesia, and she just has this, like, personality that just wakes up. Yeah, that's in the manga too. I did read it, but okay. I really like it. But Same thing with anime. It. I only watched like half of it before I did. I realized there's like way more episodes, and I'm I'm just it's not clicking with me. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I will. Like and yeah, I will definitely admit I like very have little with the source, but. I, when I was just playing the game, I wanted to just keep the game as the game. I didn't want to do like the most excessive research known to man just for Blood Plus all of a sudden and just let's watch everything. Because to be honest, I don't think I'm really gonna be that impressed. And probably then I would have just if we were doing this afterwards, all of that I would have been just like it's like to be honest, the video game is probably the best part of this franchise. <laughs> Well, let's be real. That's the easiest elevator pitch of all time. So there's a schoolgirl kills vampires. Okay, here you go. Do you want to know the story? No. Here, here's your money. Make the show. Yeah, I will admit, the, the based on the things. Oh, sorry. On yeah, no worries. Uh, based on the things that I've seen about it, it doesn't seem like it's overly sexy or anything. So at least there's that. Because it's, really, it's pretty Dragon. tame. It's just you know, schoolgirl kill vampires. Go. Yeah, I'm sorry. Whenever I see her schoolgirl, it just sometimes. I remember, like, more in the late 2000s get a little more eccentric with that, especially later on with zombies. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, like Oni Chanbara. Oni Chanbara or, like, the anime series uh, High School of the Dead. <laughs> yeah, th this is tame compared to that. It's just girl kills vampires. It's not Which really it's probably because of the time it released that I have a little theory on that, probably, because uh, someone... Some other like anime that kind of aired around its time was also affected by the same thing when I bring it up. Let me see. Just got to get that ready. Because, yeah, this the, the thing I'm talking about was came from 2004, so it's not that far off. <laughs> School days. Okay, now, now, it, they're so not really... It's not, they're not fully connected as a franchise, but it was another popular show and much more popular franchise than when it started. 
and it was affected by a certain airing of a revival of a franchise. And this was Magical Girl Lyrical Nanoha. Where, oh, I knew that. Yeah, and essentially one of the big things about it was the creator said, like, the revival era of Kamen Rider basically made him go, oh, we can do these type of stories. <laughs> and I, for to be honest, especially when I said the whole amnesia thing and realizing what that meant, I feel like I think the Blood Plus thing was following some suit on that. And then I think the video game, especially considering Suda, took a lot more notes from that. <laughs> mm-hmm. And it's also worth noting, even though sadly it never came out in the U.S., that a lot of the UI and general aesthetic is very Killer 7-like, which is why we kind of unofficially consider it a honorary Kill the Past game, even though it's really not, just because of the general aesthetic behind it. And there is, like, those slight uh, posters that say Moonlight Syndrome 2 in it. <laughs> Oh yeah, so is this oh, his? Yeah. Is this what Moonlight Syndrome Two would have been? Because that would, sounds amazing. Well, I remember, I remember back then, like also like a couple years ago, it sort of even Suda kind of considered it as that when he talked about it. It was like during some like party thing, and it was saying, I think it was when everyone was expecting like some good news about like remasters of Moonlight Syndrome and Twilight Syndrome. And then, oddly enough, Blood Plus was mentioned as two. And it was, like, literally on this, like, flyer thing. And so everyone's just like, what? Why is Blood Plus being mentioned, huh? Yeah, so given how Moonlight Syndrome 1 ends, it's kind of like, uh, how's anyone in that game going to star in anything? Unless it's, like, a dream sequence or in, they're in another reality and now they have to kill vampires, I guess? Or well, maybe he's I... just going to make a new story and then he got the rights yeah. to Blood and he's like, oh... I'll make it a blood game. And considering the jump from Twilight to Moonlight as well, that's a very drastic sequel as well. Because I think even Suda at most even considers that a more spin-off in the end. Yeah. So at this point, he probably just saw something like Moonlight Syndrome if he was going to continue it, be more of a, you know, anthology. Mm-hmm. May as well go the full nine. And but yeah, his own thing. But yeah, then think, and then another thing about this video game is that, like with Samurai Shampoo, this was before that, and Suda has talked about like, oh, Blood Plus, Samurai Shampoo. Without these two, I wouldn't have figured out the groundwork for No More Heroes. So, would you say it's more of a fun slasher like No More Heroes, or kind of a janky? I'll try it anyway. It's all right, like Samurai Shampoo. Uh, I kind of want to lean over more to the the uh, first thing you mentioned, because I will definitely say the biggest thing about this one, where Samurai Shampoo, I could definitely say had a lot of the uh, source material as the aesthetic of that one. Blood Plus just really feels like a grasshopper game. And Personally. it's cha- and it's very janky. I will definitely admit that, yeah, though. I... I, I, I... Me, I'd lean on to the, uh, the other part, where it's sort of like Samurai Champloo, because, like, it is janky, the, it's just mindless press square or whatever button it was, I forgot. Um, uh, there were a couple of buttons for some action. There was, like, a little kick thing to stun some people, and then the main slash button. Or if you're playing as the other character, just shooting. <laughs> Uh, but, correct me if I'm wrong, the full title is One Night Kiss. Which is a Smith's reference, if I'm correct. Oh, I figured it's just a reference is to it? vampires. But that makes sense, too, actually. I think it is. I can look it up. And also, there's a character on the cover with a pompadour. So. Yeah, what yeah. about him? If you can say. Because oh, he's, oh, he's not present in the original. Oh, yeah, he's just an original character. And. Um. This yeah. dude, I posted a picture of him. This guy with the pompadour and the gun on his shoulder. Yeah, the prototype Travis touchdown. Kind of reminds me of Coyote a little. Yeah, I could definitely see that. And considering Suda considered Coyote his favorite, I can probably see why he wanted to continue a character like that. 
Okay, not finding anything with the Smiths on that one, but I'm pretty sure the One Night Kiss is a musical reference. It's a title. Isn't that um, that's isn't that a New Order song or? Oh, that could be it. I'm just open Spotify. One Night Kiss song. Uh, there's a lot of people. So familiar, familiar. Like, or like I've seen it in the credit drop of Silver Case at some point. Like one mm-hmm. of the. One of the title drops said One Night Kiss or something like that. I'm sadly seeing like a lot of people doing one. I'm seeing like a result for One Night, One Kiss, One. But that's definitely not. Oh, it. Maybe it's like a mixture of different ones. I remember uh, Adrian, the speedrunner, discovered he was one he was looking it up. Uh, oh, yeah, maybe it's, it's a it reference like towards I see the perfect. Place. Maybe it's a reference towards the perfect kiss, which is done by. Ah, uh, that's what I was thinking of. Perfect kiss. Because I is, do um, think that is a game mode in that one as well. I think it is. Mm-hmm. Because this game does do a little killer seven to killer eight kind of thing, where it's like, yeah, oh. That was really <laughs> but yeah, I only have done a full run of the game on its default. And action mode, which I discovered has, because when I just saw the first two difficulty options, adventure mode and action mode, I was like, adventure mode just sounds like a like the Bobby experience. Like I'm just here for the story, which like I'm real, I really can't be here for the story, sadly. So I, I was like, I'll be, I'll be on action mode, and I, kind like, wow, well, I was in talks with uh, Adrian VG, the speedrunner guy for a lot of Grasshopper games, and he kind of said, like, what? Like, why'd you do that on your first run? <laughs> because apparently there's some slight changes to that, like, particularly with the uh, QTE segments in the game. They get a lot harder. And the fact is, I can't even know what it's actually asking me sometimes. Yeah, that, <laughs> that definitely was experience. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I definitely see the similarity to Travis. And I look at the other screen of this guy. Um, what's his name? Mr. Pompadour? Oh, Ayama. And again, you see him continuing the, the whole colored name with him, too. And that's also a character in 25th Ward. Or yeah. Silver Case, correct? Well, it's the same. It, it's like a, a similar name thing that someone in Japan literally could just have. So I think he just uses that name just for, you know, aesthetic. So, probably so it's not, it, yeah, I think because he, his full name is completely different, but I do not know on top of my head. Suda just probably just want to continue his style when making an original character for this game. Right. So would you say the game is linear? Is it like you select a level? Is it open world? How does that, it, how's the flow it, go? It is open world for that, for the most part, though. It's the structure. It's Oddly enough, it's No More Heroes 3. <laughs> There's like, there can be little side quests you can do with talking to people, but again, I'm basically playing blind because I sadly cannot read Japanese as well. There mm-hmm. are little side quests. You basically just have to keep talking with people back and forth and then like, oh, hey, I get something then, or you have to pick something up. You usually get outfits and stuff like that, which reminds me of some of the stuff in Omir's no 3, like the scorpions. Yeah, when you had to pick them up and you just, just go talk to someone again. Or the back and forth with some other quest, or the visual novel side quest in that way. Just go back and forth a lot of spots. And on top of that, the game would later just go like, oh, hey, you see those sewer drains? Just go jump down there and just fight some things. Which is very much how No More Heroes 3 did... Where it's like, oh, hey, these spots here, go fight them. You need to do them. And then you fight the big bad. And Blood Plus, you had to do them all. There weren't no, like, sub-requirements. It was just, no, do them all. And later down the line, there were going to be, like, ten different instances of these fights in a chapter for a character. And, boy, oh, boy, those fights were... Um... Drawn out. Boring very not programmed well like especially when i found out it, a certain jump slash that uh that she can do uh i forget i'm trying to remember her name now top staya she just does like a single jump and straight down jump slash and just insta kills any enemy during those segments and it was like the best thing to do compared to the actual 
doing the gameplay because the lock on can just randomly go to someone else. You have no control over it. So you get stuck lock on on someone. And then if you kill them even mid combo, the game will just be like, okay, go over there now. It's like, what? <laughs> Yeah, that sounds incredibly tedious. Like it sounds more like No More Heroes One, the not the f- non-fun side missions where you would just go in a room, kill a bunch of guys, and basically earn money to g- get the next job. Yeah, but I will say then the other kind of part that resembles No More Heroes Three were some of the boss fights because oddly enough they had like a puzzle it a puzzle uh, puzzleistic aesthetic to them where. Sometimes it's they're not as straightforward as you would think. Like, I remember one of these bosses where it was near an electrical tower. You had to hit him with... You had to stun him and cause him to fly into the fences to break him down. And immediately when you get him into the center of the electrical tower, that is when you can kill him. Only then. I was just like, that's wonky. Because... At first, I thought, when I discovered it, I was like, oh, I had to destroy all the fences then. Then I can kill him. No, I just can... You just have to destroy one fence. If he's in there, you're good. Nice. Or and my favorite... Does or she my have fa- a way of getting... A, sorry, does she have a way of getting around, like, a transportation, like the Schwal Tiger, or does she just walk everywhere? Yep, walking and running, the same with Ayama. They just... All ass. <laughs> So but I will not. Ayama too, not just Saya. Yes, they go back and forth with each other during their oh, chapters. Oh, nice! I thought he was, and, I thought he was just like a helper or someone who gives her jobs. Like um, no, they the barely interact. <laughs> they they nice. interact one time, and that's it. Huh? So it's kind of like a Yakuza Zero, like Majima and Kiryu, where the they're the two main characters, but they never meet the entire game. Yeah. It's oddly enough near the end as well. <laughs> Interesting. So hey, maybe Yakuza Zero. They took some inspiration from Blood One Night. Oh, definitely, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> but um, and, sure. but yeah, I was just saying like with some of the gameplay stuff. Like one of my other favorite bosses was like I'm just like you can actually see what like how the fight can go sometimes based on their bar. And again, sometimes their bars are just different. Like I said, with the guy with the fences, he just had fence icons on his health bar. I was just like, what? But then one fight, he had a motorcycle on his health bar. Because at a certain point in the fight, you just go destroy his motorcycle. And then the monster's just like, oh! He's just too depressed to focus on the fight because he wrecked his bike. <laughs> so I've also, I posted a screenshot of it for... And to indicate, I've heard that the text appears in a very Killer 7-like way. It's like not a normal script. It's like it appears as little g- graphics for each character, meaning um, this game would be hell to fan translate. Yeah, they all and I've heard people are struggling like with this. it. Okay, yeah, I'm it's... Uh, uh, isn't it like... Uh, not Killer 7, it was uh, Flower, Sun, and Rain. Yeah, FSR is like that too. Oh yeah, kind of like the FSR style. Although it kind of reminds me of Killer 7 when Susie talks. It kind of has the, the subtitle vibe. Yeah, I do think people have more discovered a way through FSRs, at least a little bit. But yeah, Blood Plus does not have any progress to that, mostly probably because of not really no interest. Would you say it's a tough language barrier? Like, does it have a lot of dialogue, or is it pretty much go if you and do- if you want to do the side questing? Very much heads blocked by the language barrier, one hundred percent. For the most part, there are very some moments where there's like a bit of a puzzle that you have to talk to particular people in the main story, which I did have to look up. But I kind of did kind of just kind of brute force some things. And that kind of generally worked. There's just like, oh, because I do think they had to be done in a sequence too. It's very FSR logic. And uh, other than that. No, so I would say the language barrier difficulty on this one would be like a 75%. It's only if if you want to do the side questing. If you're not doing the side questing, just want to do the fight, I would say like a 40-50%. So you can get through the main game at least with 
no problem. Yeah. As I said, like the only other little difficulty was the QTEs because they give you a prompt and tell you what it's doing, but if you can't read Japanese like me, there are definitely sometimes I'm like, what is it asking me to do? Because I think the prompt that tricked me the most was it looked like it wanted me to rotate the sticks, but in reality, it was actually like move the sticks and find like the vibration points and hold it there. I never, it took me a long time to realize that that's what it wanted me to do because it gave me like two arrows going like, oh, circle, it's a circle. So, oh, obviously I'm circling. Nope. <laughs> And also, I haven't read the manga past the one shot the manga video did, but it looks like on the manga there actually is a kind of a dual protagonist thing going. Like, there's this guy with a coffin and a sword, and um, Saya's got a sword, so I don't know if they're like, no, this guy's kind of like the frenemies or lovers. It's the main love interest. It's not a protagonist okay. at all. He appears sometimes. And yeah, oh yeah, he's he in the does, game too. Yeah, he does remember her from before she lost the me her memory. If I'm correct. Oh, okay. So, so there's, there's no connection between him and... So he's not I Ayama's replacement. He's a separate character. Yeah. He, okay. he does his own thing. Yeah. yeah, and also reading that apparently, like, he wanted to do a thing where she dies at the end, and apparently one of the creators was like, no, you can't do that. Yeah, and that's what kind of brings up when I mentioned with the whole Ayama and Saya never re and interacting... Because, spoiler alert, Ayama is the one who passes away. He dies during the game. Ah, so I guess they wanted to pull a thing where, oh, well, we can't kill her. I'll have an original character do not steal, and we'll kill him. It could have been like that, because I, I think what essentially could have happened, I think the popular theory is, that the whole thing with Saya was like supposed to be a, like, clone sort of thing and then it's left to interpretation that the rest of the story is played out by the clone where i think it's ayama who would then possibly kill the real saya because she just went nuts or something like that lost control mm. it also kind of makes me think of has anyone played folklore on the ps3 it's an that name sounds kind of monster familiar. Or something game. It has there a similar thing. There's two game. characters who never meet, and at the very end, one of them, some, well, one of them doesn't die, but it's kind of like revealed that they're not real or they're a dream, and it kind of makes me think of that. Yeah, and there's definitely, an, there was also those like Square Enix RPG that had a similar thing where it's all separate stories and such, and they never really interact like way back. Like, I think it was in the 90s, it's like a uh, Data Live? Data Live? Oh, uh, Live Alive. Oh, Live, live alive. alive. Okay. Yeah, Data Live, that's an anime th property, I think. <laughs> but yeah, yeah I, I will definitely admit, like, the most repetitive part of the game is definitely the barrier of, like, you... This is, like, the hard pass for a lot of people. I definitely remember people telling me this game going like, oh, you'll never like it. It sucks. You're just, you're just gonna hate it. And I can see it, but I don't know when I just let the presentation sit with me and I like, I generally like the boss fights even with the jank. I don't know. I like this more than the Samurai Shampoo game in the end. Yeah, it's funny if you look at it. I, I just posted a screenshot of Blood C and then the original Blood the Last Vampire. They really do like three completely different characters. So this feels like very much an anthology thing. Um, from what I remember from The Last Vampire, it's still her. Like, it's still the same character. Oh, it is? Interesting. Um, it seems yeah, like an she's... entirely different person. That, wow, well, that maybe could be the reason for the amnesia stuff. Maybe it's just a, you know, a memory thing or like is, a subconscious that moves around. It is, because she, she's like a thousand years old vampire she fought in a, uh, war, in a war or something okay yeah i could definitely tell you the game did not have any of this really because mostly it was just from the looks of it to me especially when i got to this one part where saya confronts like this little boy which it looked like he went through the transformation and he didn't want that but he then just dies because his body couldn't m maintain it she don't 
she then goes kills the mother who was like this big beast. So yeah, you kind of see like in the original, it's like you know solitary badass, and the second is kind of like innocent who has to kill and doesn't want to, and then in Blood Sea, she's right back to badass again. Yeah, I don't know if her in Blood Sea. Probably is. I do know a lot of people do not like Blood Sea. Any time I was looked had any slight lookups of it, like people just do not like this one. So, eh, unsure. <laughs> And then, last and definitely least, there's a live action one, apparently. Yeah. Which, I want to. Uh, who directed that? Cover of that? Now that she's here, there will be blood. So, oh. Uh, it's directed by a guy named Chris, Chris Nahon. He's a pa- French film director? <laughs> so, and, a... uh, but from what I've seen, and posted here it looks like the original definitely had the highest budget because like i think that one screenshot there has more detail than anything i see in blood plus or blood c that looks like that looks like that's money right there well yeah usually film budgets are always higher than a tv budget true but like this especially that's like that's why manga video usually only does movies because it gives them a better image than showing cheap tv shows like look our stuff's all high budget cinema which yeah, it definitely probably points more towards why Suda just kind of wanted to do his own thing with the game, even to the point where the IP owner could have got mad at him. Because, first of all, it sucks being restricted, number one. <laughs> and then he probably just couldn't really think of, like, how do I follow up this, like, story? Like, just... Like, I don't think he wanted to say anything around it. Like, I don't think I'm being better than this. I just want to do my own thing just because I... Yeah. He probably couldn't... Like, knowing how for the Samurai Shampoo game, he actually got to bounce off with the anime director, the same guy for Cowboy Bebop. Anytime I look up the Blood Plus game, I hear no mention of that. So he probably just was, you know, sent blind. It's called, like, just do it. We want the game. We want sales. Do it. <laughs> Yeah, now with going forward, he can do his own thing. So I don't worry about canon or no, you can't kill them. No, you can't do this. Okay, well, now it's my character. I can do whatever I want. And definitely one thing I mentioned before that points towards this too is that the monster's portrayal in this game is seems very different from the source. Like, extremely different. Like, there's a lot more just, as I said, like people who are transforming into these creatures which again unsure if the source did that as well it seems like it happened in more rare occurrences compared to most of the series where it's just like oh hey some monsters out there <laughs> yeah i think that was the thing in the movie too like they they, they would get cha- turned okay so will. which makes sense vampires usually you know go to others and turn them and on top kinda of like, that the- like blade. okay and on top of that, like, how the monsters looked in the game, <laughs> especially some of them, which are, like, big, bulking polygon messes, like, they kind of look like more beefed-up Heaven Smiles than anything. Mm-hmm. Is it a difficult game? It can be if you're not good with, uh, how should I say, adapting towards some jank. Like, if you're just mashing the buttons thinking, like, oh, it's gotta be just smooth action... No, you're gonna have a hard time. You need to kind of understand that you kind of have to play it slow. You have to understand what is being presented at all times. Do Ayama and Saya play the same way? Like, are they both, or is it like one has guns, one has swords? Because it kind of yep. makes you think of Oni Chunbara, where you have one character uses the katana and one uses guns, if I remember yeah. right. Ayama has like no gimmick, really. He is just gun. You just shoot until it's dead. <laughs> nice. He is a lot easier to play because of that, but you don't really get a lot of like cool little aesthetic moments with him because Saya has a like blood fury thing when she fills up her oddly enough her blood bar, which fills up with roses as its symbol. <laughs> Very killer killer is dead mentality. And then she just kind of goes on a blitzkrieg of, like, fast attacks, which, for the bosses, you always have to get to, like, dismember them. 
So like, right. does it like take big chunks off your help when you drain them, or? Essentially, it's the only way to technically progress in the boss fights. Like, you have to get rid of like arms, a head, a leg, or stuff like that, etc., to get to the point where you can just do the finishing QT on them. Okay. And do you, do they each get different bosses at least? So like they're not playing yes. the same game. When yes, they, the character? all all different bosses. Oh, okay, that's good. There can be some repeats, but the only repeats are like the ones that are still exclusive to the character. And do you go back and forth between the two? Do you play whatever you order you can want? No, there's no control of the order. It's just back and forth. So essentially, oh. the recommend plane of Silver Case. It's kind of like it's like Yakuza Zero. You don't have you just get bounced between the two as the story. Yeah. That's- on how much of No More Heroes in this, is in this game? It's it. I would definitely say it's a little bit lesser than Samurai Champloo, but as I said, really? it yeah, just a Feels little more. bit. Mostly because there is the open world hub, and the combat in in general seems a little more its own thing. As I said, it even has a it seems like it had more of a killer is dead mechanic that would pop him in the future, but. Oddly enough, like, particularly to me, it feels more No More Heroes 3, which is the funniest part. Because the pacing of it, the, like, again, just going to these designated fight areas and then fight the boss and just do that back and forth. Because even Ayama has to do that as well at a later point. He just has to go, like, oh, get some jumping in sewers and just got to shoot a bunch of things up. (laughs) So how about the music? Is it Takata? No, uh, I think it's Ma. Oh, wait, Takata. I, yeah, Masafumi. It's Masafumi. Nice. And is the music good? Okay. Well, yeah. or... There's definitely still some great tracks in it. Like one of my favorite ones, which is sadly restricted to one area of the open world. I think it's like Night Sea is the track. I think, mm. and it's just this very moody, depressing track of this, this long. It's very like I think it's with piano and some type of synthesized instrument and just keeps holding on these long notes. Just gives a little sense of eeriness, but also a sad vibe to it. Mm-hmm. It's definitely my favorite track. So yeah, if you want to drop the chat, drop the track in the chat, and we'll probably play it as an intro or outro. So let people hear the music from it. I'm always down for that. <laughs> okay, I'll do that afterwards. But um, but yeah, like and. Knowing this was Suda51, who also worked on this too, I do think there's also something in this game which maybe could have been inspiration for No More Heroes. And I think that's particularly for Shinobu. Oh, yeah, I saw that in your blog post where you, she kind of, where like she kills three students turned monsters, and Shinobu, when you meet her, she kills three former students or something yeah. along those lines. Yeah, just because, like, I. Don't know what Shinobu is doing, but she was just in her classroom. Travis goes like, hey, you ready? And then she just kills her classmates right in front of her. I was like, okay. <laughs> yeah, I gather they were either some, like, they were bullies maybe she was getting revenge on. I don't think there was anything monstrous. It's just like, she didn't like those girls. Yeah, there's really no much implication towards them. It just probably Shinobu just didn't like her school life. There could have been more towards that. And as for yeah. what Saya and why she had to do that, it did seem like the three girls before transforming were a bit kind of those like drama queens kind of thing. So maybe there was something towards that as well. But uh, again, yeah. sadly, well, maybe, language barrier. Was it with Shinobu? Yeah. Uh, no, I, I thought it was because she wanted to hide her ass- assassin life. Yeah, that could have been it too possibly which again kind of does point a lot uh, some towards saya as well because they have this dual personality thing then or dual identity where saya mostly has amnesic and stuff like that and she's seeming like this harmless schoolgirl, but then she trans yeah she wakes up in moments and goes like well gotta kill <laughs> Again, yeah, it could be it could be stretching in a bit, but it is just kind of interesting knowing that Blood Plus would lead up to No More Heroes. And I'm like, especially knowing Saya would be considered a femme fatale. Mm-hmm. 
And it's also interesting, I noticed that it's published by Namco Bandai, so maybe this was part of the Shampoo arrangement. Like, maybe he had a deal with Bandai to make games out of a couple of their licenses, and they gave him money to keep the company going. Oh, yeah, the most that's definitely what happened. Suda has even admitted that, where these those two projects were just to get some money. Yeah. Hey, they still have his style. What's interesting is I noticed it's rated Sarah B, which means it's probably not that violent. No, as I said, like uh, there's really no blood and gore in this game at all because they replace it with old school tokusatsu effects, and I'm not lying on that. Like monsters are spark- having sparks flying out of their body, and when they die, they just have these weird bubble or crystallization effects. That just really screams like they were like shocker monsters from the original shows. Nice. That's, uh, yeah, it's usually worse than pay homage to Kamen Rider. In fact, would, would you say it's a better Kamen Rider game than some of the actual Kamen Rider games? Well, most sadly, most Kamen Rider games are just fighting games. Like, the only one that's kind of more different, different would be like the Musou games or the oddly enough Resident Evil inspired one. <laughs> There's a Resident Evil inspired Kamen Rider game? What? Yeah, it's called like Safe Foon. It has like V3, Agito, and Black in it. It's janky and it's. There's really not a lot of good action in the game, but you're generally going to A to B kind of things, finding like uh, card keys, puzzle moments. And it's like, this is just Resident Evil. What is this? <laughs> Isn't there also a Super Robot Wars? Yeah, they also pop up in those uh, Super Robot Wars sometimes. It's not a choice of riders, like V3, Agito, and Black? Yeah, I think Agito was airing at the time this when this game released. And V3 and Black are just incredibly popular. <laughs> Fair. So, Which, let's see. I I guess I, at... Sorry, I was going to say, I think that kind of segues into something else, which I kind of find interesting with the story of Blood Plus with the game was focusing more on the people turning into these monsters. I feel like that may be an, another thing Suda was taking inspiration from the franchise as well. Because uh, particularly the early 2000s for Kamen Rider really did that a lot. Like, especially Fies, where the whole monster race are a bunch of people who died and then reawaken with a second life. And they're just these monsters now. And there's a whole society around them and such. And it's just this back and forth of like both the monsters fighting each other, monsters fighting Fies, or like them taking the Fies bell for themselves. It goes back and forth, and it's very entertaining. I've been re-watching it lately. And I now just keep thinking, like, it could have been the inspiration knowing that I, I have no doubt Suda was probably watching these shows. Mm-hmm. And so looking at the screens, it looks like a lot of it takes place in or around school. Is it a, Does it have a good variety, or is it pretty much all in, in or around the school? It's actually, oddly enough, it's beginning at the school, and then for the majority, you're in the city, and then it ends at the school. Okay, so there's some decent variety, would you say? Uh... I would say yes, but also no. Mostly because of those sewer fights, where, again, you're just jumping in oh, down yeah. sewers, and it's the same sewer environment, no matter what. It's the same, like, Action. dark green environment that you're in, and it's just... Bleh. I never got tired of looking at that one. Mm-hmm. And now that I think about it, that guy I posted with the guitar on his back, that's the dude from the manga, I'm guessing, her love interest. Yeah. Wolfwood looking dude. Okay. I was about to say, like, guitar. I was like, Kiter? <laughs> no, he has a violin. It's a coffin? Yeah, I think it's like a shello or something. It's a shell. Yeah, okay. how's it called? It's, um, wait. It's definitely a big Maybe? instrument. Because I think he. He's like, a Django. Because I also remember him playing it when I go to talk to him. A contrabass. Yeah. Oh, contrabass, okay. Oh, there's your um, sound euphonium spinoff. <laughs> but yeah, like, I will definitely say I had a lot more positive time with this than I did with Samurai Champloo. Mostly because it I looks think... Like it looks like a better game, at least aesthetically. Like, it has more personality. 
And also on top of that, I think the boss fights just did better for me. Because I remember Samurai Shampoo, I just had a nightmare with a lot of the bosses. Like, and I mean a lot of problems. For the Blood Plus, I only remember one boss giving me like a most, or like two to three gave me resets. Because A, I didn't figure things out. B, there actually was an instant death QTE. And and I don't, I, I just said three, but I can't think of C at the moment. I think it was kind of the same area of like, I just didn't pick something up. Mm-hmm. Are there any cutscenes, like anything anime inspired or from the anime, or is it strictly in engine stuff? In engine stuff. There are some FMVs, but it's still in the style of the game graphics. Okay, so you don't get straight up anime cutscenes, which Samurai Champloo didn't either. It, it yeah. was all awkward 3D renderings. Yeah, I will definitely say the 3D rendering in this game looks a lot better, mostly because the Killer7 aesthetic is alive on this. So it kind of aged better, in my opinion, for sure. And oddly enough, like, I think the only thing from the anime was, like, Saya's, like, phone wallpaper in her menu. And then, again, the end of the game, where it looks like, oh, it looks like she woke up from a dream. So, yeah, there's your safe out to say you didn't want Suda messing with your stuff. Yeah, it definitely seems very obvious in that regard, especially knowing that Suda got, like, a bit, like, no nose. <laughs> so, yeah, Which I'll actually like, go into Japan. I was going to say, considering go Bandai Namco is part of this, I can definitely see that, because that company is pretty infamous for doing stuff like that. Absolutely. And now, if you even work for the... Compose for Namco, now you're just the Namco sound team, but a lot of companies do that. Yeah, I've been hearing the mess with Sunrise with that lately. Yeah, Sega does it too, the Sega sound team, Namco sound team, you know, so you don't have to credit your composers. Apparently, now you just own everything they do. Yeah, sadly, I think that started because of the Dragon Quest guy. I think that's how it all started. Mm-hmm. But Yuzo Koshiro still gets his props. You'll never see Yuzo Koshiro be credited as Namco sound team. That you can bet yeah. on. Yeah, I think, again, I think because back then, he essentially found that, like, oh, they're the guy who tried this trickery. I'm not going to fall for that. So he made his, like, actual own studio and such. Yeah. To this day, he's the only composer I've ever seen credited on a title screen. Yeah. I, I, uh, I did see Masafumi Takata's credit and stuff, so I think Suda's definitely True. a more uh, play ball oh, yeah, kind he, of guy. I think, yeah, I don't think he would let them do that to his team. Yeah, oh, yep, Akira Yamaoka. Very good one there. Mm-hmm. Konami definitely made sure his name was flapped on a lot of things. Oddly enough, EA did that too for Shadows of the Damned. Where it's no, like, it's about to say, uh, yeah. Suda51, Shinji Mikami, Akira Yamaoka. It's, I like that they, they had to, It really just felt like, like, oh, these are big names. Put them on the box. Mm. Yeah. Let's see. I'm looking, it looks like there's some PS2 content but of Blood Last Year, but it looks like they might just be re-releases of the movie or maybe promo discs, but they do have some cool covers. Yeah. And maybe that's I do, a demo. Yeah, and I do also remember like the uh, gaming Brit video he also brought up. There was like another Blood Plus game. I think it was more PSP, though. And... Again, I, he does bring up a good point. Like, I wonder how that one played because it's like, like it's not pseudo related. It's just another tie-in thing. Like, maybe while well, it works better, it probably is just boring as a result. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, yeah. Do you two have any questions about the games? I think Common's the only one who's actually played it. <laughs> Sadly, I yes. played it like five years ago. <laughs> yeah, I played it like for half an hour. Two years and uh, yeah. yeah, I do not blame I you for not. I, I do not blame anyone for not finishing it. I but I will it. say, if you are the kind of pseudo fan who kind of likes to see the process of how the like the past comes into the future, this game is one hundred percent one of those things. Because even with Samurai Champloo, there are some little elements where I was just like, wow, this still came up today. Like yeah. both that and Samurai Champloo had stuff. In No More Heroes 3, 100%. You can, see the bread, you can see the breadcrumbs leading to the present. Yeah. Which, it's kind of funny with No More Heroes 3 with Blood Plus, because again, 
back then for No More Heroes 3, there was got to be a lot more open world stuff, but COVID happened, they were sadly losing time, and the open world uh, was tanking because of the things they were trying to do. So, a part of me feels like Suda just kind of had a thinking moment when he just thought back, going like, oh yeah, Blood Plus. You could just do that to, like, you know, speed it, speed the process up. Again, well, I will not be I will not be surprised because it's too uncanny. They are way too mm-hmm. similar. Well, I will be in Japan in about a week, and this seems like one of those games that I could probably find on the shelf at Book Off or you know, uh, Mandarake for like less than two thousand yen. So if I grab a copy on the cheap, I'll be sure to do that. Oh, yeah, I, I remember when I have I have a sealed copy. I have not even opened it. <laughs> Yeah, I remember when I bought it, it was only like fifty bucks or stuff like that. Really, I, mean, I got it I guess, fairly recently. Yeah, no, I got it from uh, I think it was that site called Baiyi or something. Okay, I think, it got, I, I, think I just did like fifteen dollars. I think I did yeah, it through I eBay. eBay. I th- oh, um, oh no, it was yeah, no, it was like thirty twenty. I'm thinking about the Samurai Shampoo game because I was yeah. about to say. Because I remember with the Samurai Shampoo, I got it for a reasonable price, and now these days, you're have to pay up like a hundred freaking dollars for that. For Blood right, Plus, the, the price never changed because it's an import. Yeah, I'm looking at it online. It looks like it's about 30 bucks. So, And the yen is really weak right now, so I bet I could probably get it for like 2,500 yen or 3,000 yen or thereabouts. Yeah. And the best part a, about... Yeah. And the best part from buying from Japan directly, too, you most likely got to have very good condition. <laughs> Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, as long as Customs isn't like, is this that Grasshopper game? Yeah, you have to turn that in. We won't let you bring that out. Okay. <laughs> I, I found, when I went to Tokyo, I found, like, a, a limited edition Zone of the Enders. Um, it Ooh. was a collector's edition with, like, both the OVAs. No, it, it had the OVA that did in both games. And it was, like, only oh, nice. a thousand of them. Oh, yeah, I saw so much room. cool stuff. Everything has a collector's edition. I saw a collector's edition for Machete, for Grow Lanzer. There's a FSR reprint of the book, which I'm definitely going to try to find if it's still I where I left it. it. I searched it everywhere. Searched everywhere. Oh, everywhere. The FSR book I actually saw at the basement of, Nakan, of um, Mandarake in Shibuya, so I know exactly where to find it. The question is if it's still there, and if it is, is it still going to be 100 bucks, or if it's going to have skyrocketed? So we'll see. That's one of my goals, and... And if anyone's wondering, I did look up Grasshopper Manufacturer. They're in a nondescript office building, and there's two people outside who I'm pretty sure suit his personal guard. So <laughs> I'll have to defeat them. And then you have to go through the bosses as you go through, because you most oh, yeah. likely have you have to fight Maddie, you have to fight James. Oh, well, guaranteed. If you've ever seen the raid, I'm pretty sure that's Grasshopper's corporate building. Oh. Oh, oh my god, it'd be so funny if, like, again, joking you saying this, but it'd be so funny when you do this, they're just watching Char's counterattack. Yeah, that, I could totally picture that. You just, like, knock on the door, and they're all just sitting there watching anime, like, hey, hi, well, is this Grasshopper? Well, yeah. Well, Suda kind of confirmed to... that, that, uh, I, I think he was joking, but he said, like, once per month they watch Char's counterattack. <laughs> Still need to watch. Well, my friend's movie. a huge Gundam fan, so if I know, if that's happening, he'll probably sit down and watch it with him. <laughs> He's like, okay, you guys do that. I'm just going to look around and grab whatever swag I can find. Yeah, I think the boss hierarchy of you fighting through Grasshopper would be like the guards, Maddie, James, uh, Ren Yamazaki, and then probably Suda. Yeah, it's like um, where Transmitter said, you arrive in a long white hallway. Suda is waiting for you with a baseball bat. You must fight <laughs> Suda. And that's oh, the review on. process, by the way. He probably has another replica beam katana somewhere. <laughs> yeah, I'll fight you. Come on. And he's, while well, fighting you, he's got to be dropping Takashi Miike titles at you. <laughs> Takashi oh, Miike. Yeah, like, I'll just have to answer trivia about Takashi Miike films. And if, if I don't even pass the trivia, I don't even get to meet him. Oh, no, it'll even be worse. It won't even be a fight. It'll be that silver case section. Oh, where you just get all the random trivia. <laughs> Yeah, that, there'll be a hundred question thing posted outside the door, and if you don't get a high enough score, the door won't even open. And the points won't matter, too, so you just gotta be lost. Most people who don't make it in are just too, uh, how should I say, uh, they get too irritated with it and just leave. <laughs> yeah, so we'll see. 
if I'm in the area, I'll definitely just walk by the building. I hear generally Japanese corporate buildings are very – they frown upon you going in there if you don't have any actual business. So it's not like – Which makes sense. In there, so we'll see how that goes. Yeah. It makes sense. But at the same time, I wouldn't be surprised if Suda is not the biggest fan of some traditional stuff like that. Because I definitely know he has talked about his disinterest in press conferences and such. Yeah. Uh, remind, reminds me when he was like- – it reminds me when he was at the first Switch press conference of how nervous he was there because he just did not like the environment and just a bunch of like business suit people just looking at him. Hence why he went off script and the translator couldn't translate. You also see in all these interviews, he seems to get not irritated, but when people ask him the same generic questions, you can just see he's kind of like, ah, yeah, this, this, um, and this. Oh, God, that like, happens. answering canned trivia questions like oh how do you feel about developing for this and how do you feel about this and what did you what were you inspired by when you made this he hates questions like that yeah mostly because he's kind of david lynch in that way where he just kind of wants to make you think about these things a little more he doesn't want to give you a direct answer and on top of that that reminds me of when people were asking him about lollipop chainsaw at pax east (laughs) so here's a fun tip for all you interviewers out there who might be listening. If you interview Suda, ask, give him your theories about a certain story or an obscure character. Ask if you think this guy from Moonlight Syndrome is this guy from Silver Case. You'll get a smile out of him, I guarantee it. Yeah. No how obscure it is. Oddly enough, I think uh, Genry, that one video maker out there, he straight up had a copy of Moonlight Syndrome on him and had him sign it and he said the look of Suda's face was utter shock. <laughs> yeah, like, you will impress him. But the older you... More obscure you bring up, he will remember it, and he will remember you. I promise. Yeah. To be honest, any questions I would have for him these days, just a lot of development questions of what, like... Because, again, like, as I said, like, with No More Heroes 3, I'm just curious of, like, was, like, Blood Plus, like, the idea when all of a sudden you had to sadly get a little more, uh, rush No More Heroes 3 out because of the copyright situation... I just thought about exactly what I would ask him if when he did the live action stuff in Travis Strikes Again, what did, was it like doing the live action stuff in Silver Case or did he like having a higher budget or did he prefer working street level with one person in a room? Because I um, love live action. Yeah, uh, funny enough, I would probably have a similar question when I'm dressed up as Double Gainer because I have done it before. I do have that costume still. I'll definitely ask awesome. him like, what happened with those props? Why were each one of those switchblades a thousand dollars? And honestly, his answer would probably be, eh, "That's what we had lying around. That's what we used." Well, who's it? No, that's definitely not. That's not what's lying around. A thousand dollars for each of them? That's too grand for those props. That is definitely not a case of that was just lying around. They went above and beyond for no reason. <laughs> Excellent. So I will say, though, if anyone, if I, by some miracle, I do run into Suda without getting my head bashed in by his baseball bat, if anyone has any questions they want me to ask him, I'm always open, as long as it's something I think he'll like. So I'm not going to ask him anything where he's going to look at me like I'm an idiot. <laughs> uh, I'll so I think that, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I think we are coming up on an hour. Do you three guys have anything special to share? Um, oh, really? No, 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 no almost nothing. Nothing. Seven minutes until an hour. That's good. We pretty much covered everything there is in the game, I believe, unless there's anything cool that stood out to you. Um, um, Not really. I think I covered most of all the ground I wanted to say because the game can be frustrating. Yes, I can admit that. But it had less frustrations for me personally than the Samurai Shampoo game. It was easier to get through for me because... You kind of just kind of figure out the flow because, again, it's just designated fights, designated fights, and then the boss fights. While you can have some moments of being a little, like, hmm? If you're generally still keeping up good with the action, not taking hits, even if you'll get sort of stuck, you'll figure it out soon and you won't really die through certain bosses because, again, they just kind of get stuck in a phase at a moment or two. So yeah, if you do tackle it, definitely have a guide or maybe a video playthrough handy. So I don't yeah. know if the fan translation is going to happen. If it does, they may have That's, just gotten frustrated. Yeah, the best source right now is Adrian VG. 
he has direct playthroughs of the adventure mode with all the side quests and he has just speed run runs with no cutscenes or anything you just get to see like what was the like like what's your point a to point b just do that and yeah he has played on all modes of the game so any little nuanced differences are shown in those videos there as well awesome so yeah, I guess if no one has anything, um, any cool things in Japan you think that's worth checking out, even suit it, Grasshopper Jason or not? The Common Rider Cafe. <laughs> there is one? Is that in Akihabara or Nakano? Where I is that do at? not know, sadly. That's just the first thing that came to my mind. <laughs> it's a secret. I'll, if I, maybe Suda will tell me. I bet you he knows. Hell, he probably knows. Oh. I definitely know he probably had to go there at some point in his life. There's I'm sure no that would be smart. Ask Suda what his favorite Common Rider show is. That'll probably get a smile out of him. Bring up stuff that has nothing to do with Grasshopper. He'll well, love talk his ear off about movies. Super I want to. I don't know. The question I want to ask him is like a very obscure Tokusatsu, but I just keep looking back at it as like this. Like this had to be the start of it, because it was the year 1996, the same year as Ultraman Tiga, his favorite Ultraman. So he clearly was watching television around that time, and the show changed Jirion just. It has a very, it's very meta in terms of towards tokusatsu as a whole. And I feel like No More Heroes has had that kind of same feel about it. Especially with their main characters at the time. Like, they're both juvenilistic, a little bit slightly perverted, that's for sure. Very ladies' man kind of thing. They try to hit on people but always fail. But then you kind of start figuring out, like, who they really are. They're, they have a sort of... Still, like, a code to them, even if they're, like, a very flawed person. And I was talking with this, with someone who has been playing No More Heroes regionally. Uh, yeah, originally, like, n recently. <laughs> but he got to fight Holly Summers, and I was like, it's kind of funny when I look back at Changerion episode 6, oddly enough, where Holly was rank 6, the character Kira, the hero has to fight a dark side monster who ends up being a girl he fell in love with and he sadly had to take her down. And he is holding her body before she fully vanishes the same way as Travis was holding Holly's exploded corpse. And they're both near bodies of water. I'm just like, that can't be a coincidence. Like, it, the number six matches up, the bodies of water, like, the love interest stuff. It's like, ah, like, there's no way. <laughs> I bet if you started talking to Suda about Common Rider, not only would he talk to you, he'd probably pull out some DVDs and say, hey, want to watch it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wouldn't be surprised he has, like, laser disc sets. Oh, absolutely. And to your earlier question, I'm looking it up, and is there a Common Rider store that's apparently in Tokyo, somewhere near uh, Shioda, which is in the near Chuo City of Minato, so it's it's probably on the the, uh, the main line. And there is a cafe, but it looks like it's a... Uh, like a kind of a restaurant, but it's it's way out on the west side of Tokyo. Common Rider, okay. the diner. It's in yeah. Koshima. Yeah, that's the place. I me I always remember people who film in there. There's a there's always like this giant chair representing the ch like you can sit as the shocker leader. That sounds you amazing. Can, you can film in that area, but you can't film in the store if I'm correct. Because yeah, I they told have... me that. Steins Gate Cafe. I couldn't take photos, so I took a photo as I was leaving because I didn't fly halfway around the world not to get a picture of the place. <laughs> so yeah, that'd be really cool, and maybe I'll actually find a mythical Blu-ray or DVD of Common Rider Zoe, which still has yet to happen in the U.S. I will. Do, I will say this: be prepared to pay for a good price on that. Toei can be. If pretty... I can find it, I'll, just to have an actual physical copy of the game that isn't the Sega CD game, I'll probably bite. Yeah, Toei can be a little, how should I say, penny pincher over there with their properties. At so it's somewhat... a movie and not a show. Yeah. But I will still not be surprised because if, like, buying, like, the most recent Kamen Rider series in their box sets, they'll have the whole show, you have to pay, like, $500. And that's with the conversion same. in mind. It's nuts. If I find it for 100 bucks, I might buy it if it's a really nice package. But we'll see. But yeah, okay. Well, yeah, we're getting very off topic now. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. So well, kind of is. But anywho, yeah, we are on an hour, so I guess we'll 
seg on that unless any do you have anything to add about blood or common rider? <laughs> I didn't remember my blood, so yeah, uh, watch Common Rider Five. That's all I gotta say. Yeah, and watch Common Rider Zone. <laughs> okay, so yeah, um, we'll work out what we're gonna talk about next time. We'll find some pseudo adjacent thing, I'm sure. So this has been CJ Wakura. This has been Infinite. This has been Quill. And Common Sentai. And the cat's not dead, and neither are the cats. And the cat's asleep on my end. <laughs> yeah. Same here. Oh, Deuces. Bye bye.